yesterday we discussed how migration of ideas from one culture to another culture creates different problems so we saw examples from uh, english to kannada and kannada to english when the translation took place what are the problems that were faced so that we discussed yesterday so today i take examples from sanskrit text so one example from arthashastra how it was translated in the last 100 years and what are the problems then one from bhagavad gita how it was translated and another from upanishad so let us take three examples uh, and let us examine whether these translations are really helpful to understand this text or are they creating any problems if they are creating problems how to understand that problem so let us examine that so i begin so let us begin with uh, the translations why we need translations maybe if we take this sanskrit text we need translations to understand these texts because everyone can't understand sanskrit so these translations are very much helpful to understand different texts so then the question will be why we why we have to understand those texts for example why we have to understand arthashastra so we can say so understand the society it can be this is one this can be one reason there can be many, many reasons but one reason can be to understand the society the translation will be helpful for example how indian ancient indian politics was there to know that we think arthashastra is helpful so since it is difficult to read arthashastra in sanskrit so we think translations are more reliable more helpful to understand what is there what is said in arthashastra so that we can understand the ancient indian politics so make sense of certain societies is a, is one of the reasons to uh, to read to uh, make translations and uh, to read those translations then the question will be so do the translations provide appropriate understanding of the text so if they provide appropriate understanding of the text then we can say or then we can, the goal which we had means understanding the society we can have a understanding of the society if we can understand the text by these translations if these translations are not at all useful to understand the text then it is also very difficult to understand the society of that time after after time so if we agree with the translations then we will have to agree that the contemporary discourse about india is true whatever it may be whether it is correct or not if the translations are correct then whatever the discussion because all these discussions today whatever we find on artha shastra or dharma shastra or whatever we find mainly they are based on the on these translations so if the translations are correct then we have to agree that the contemporary discourse about india is true but on contrary if we say the contemporary discourse about india is problematic then the translation must have huge problems so let us examine this with three uh, with three texts first we let us begin with artha shastra so artha shastra is uh, considered one of the important text to understand ancient indian politics we all know this is uh, very helpful to is also called uh, text of state craft so we think it is very helpful to understand ancient indian uh, politics and uh, it was considered to be lost and uh, it was rediscovered by r shama shastri in uh, 1906 so he was a scholar at uh, mysore oriental research institute and he re rediscovered artha shastra and since then so there has been continued continuous scholarly effort to understand this uh, text artha shastra especially what it says about politics so many have engaged to understand artha shastra and how we can uh, what uh, what what insights we can get, get about ancient indian politics all these discussions we will find beginning many like pv uh, it can be pv kane or uh, uh, historians like uh, romila thapar history and many have discussed based on artha shastra so in the but in the modern day discussions so the major aspect of politics so 
so when we say see them all this modern discussion it can be from pv kane or uh, histerman or any anyone if we say even in the recent uh, work of patrick oliver he translated the arthashastra into english it was published from oxford university press so if we see all these discussions about arthashastra so it is based on particular type of understanding about politics so what is this particular type of understanding so if we see the discussions on politics so one of the key concept in all these discussions is the concept of state so the concept of state is very much important so without that we won't find any it can be anyone uh, see the discussions of uh, romila thapar or pv kane the concept of state is very much important in the discussions of arthashastra and also even in the discussions of politics so when we discuss the concept of poli uh, the state then there is one more important concept that is sovereignty so without discussion discussing on the concept of sovereignty it is impossible to discuss on the concept of state so and there are many what is sovereignty it is uh, minimally we can say complete authority so uh, today we say it's complete authority over a ter territory so minimally it's complete authority or something it is uh, called uh, it is considered as sovereignty minimally so without this concept the concept of sovereignty we can't discuss on the concept of state so because there is uh, because the state is sovereign so it can uh, legislate laws and uh, it can delegate powers to someone all this all this is possible because of this uh, concept of sovereignty so there are many other concepts related to the state such as law authority government citizenship so th these are these form a concept cluster so so while we discuss about state these are the concepts sovereignty law government so all these concepts are required to understand what is state so so one of the concepts in this cluster is sovereignty so if we say the concept and uh, yeah so when this astashastra was read discovered by shama shastri there was already a debate about ancient indian politics so many were participated in this uh, discussion so there were orientalists and uh, they said the ancient indian political institutions were just tax gathering institutions means no sophisticated institution of law was there therefore there was a, de a despotic rule in ancient indian so the uh, there, there was de despotic rule in ancient indian uh, politics so, and uh, there were some indians they argued that so it was not uh, just a ca tax gathering institution so there were limited monarchy means limited sovereignty was there so it, it may not be absolute sovereignty but uh, some type uh, uh, limited sovereignty was there even uh, during ancient times there was some indians argued and then nationalists came and they argued no so sophisticated theories of state were there in india and when shama shastri rediscovered arthashastra they got evidences or they gathered evidences from arthashastra to state or to argue that the sophisticated theories of state existed even during the period of arthashastra so this was the background discussion so when the arthashastra was rediscovered by shama shastri so already there was a discussion how to uh, make sense of such texts so when Arth when uh, uh, shama shastri rediscovered arthashastra so these background discussions helped him to translate the text arthashastra also so and uh, he they discussed the these concepts like uh, sovereignty and all these concepts were also uh, even shama shastri says these concepts were are there in arthashastra so the question will be so there are many other many concepts to say the concept of state existed in arthashastra but one of the key concept is sovereignty so without which we can't discuss discuss this concept so the question will be whether the concept of sovereignty existed in arthashastra or not if it is there then we can say okay the some kind of state was there and some kind of uh, uh, so sovereign monarch was there during the time of arthashastra but the question will be whether the concept of sovereignty is there in arthashastra whether it is discussed in arthashastra or not there is a question and minimally to say the concept of sovereignty was existed 
there should be a word in Sanskrit or there should be a word in Arthashastra to discuss this concept. So the question will be whether there is a word in Arthashastra to discuss the concept of sovereignty. And if we see the translations, they think there is a word. So which word is, is that? Yeah, so before going that, this is an introduction by Patrick Olival and uh, uh, on the translation he did Arthashastra. He says, the king to whom the Arthashastra is addressed is an absolute monarch. All authority in areas of governance, law, economic activities, foreign relations, and the conduct of war rests with him. So it's not only nationalists, even Indologists today accept the concept of sovereignty existed, is, is there in Arthashastra. And uh, this introduction is also says, he's an absolute monarch, is what he says. So to say absolute monarch, the concept of sovereignty should be there. So, yeah, and if we see the translations, so there are three important translations. The first, Dr. R. R. Shama Shastri translated it into English. Then uh, R. P. Kangale, he did critical edition and also he translated it into English. Then recently, Patrick Oliver, he also translated it into English. So if we see these translations, the one word you will find in most of these uh, Sanskrit, uh, is that there are sentences, yeah. So Aishwarya is common, though in this there, there is no Aishwarya, but uh, in all other rows you will find Aishwarya. So in the last two rows there is a different word, Chakravarti and Dekaraja. But in most of the places you will find the word Aishwarya. So we can say the word Aishwarya has been translated as sovereignty. So Ekaishwaryam, sovereignty and Ekaishwaryam, Aishwarya. Here these two translated as sovereignty. And Mahadaishwarya, again sovereign power. Ekaishwarya, again sovereignty. So again here also Aishwarya. So, the word Aishwarya has been translated, though there is no consistency between all these translators, but the word Aishwarya has been translated as sovereignty in all these translations. And uh, in Patrick Oliver's translation, you will find consistency everywhere he translated as sovereignty only. So, then, so the, the, then the, now the question will be, is it possible to translate the word Aishwarya as sovereignty? Because this is a Sanskrit word and there are some conditions how to understand this uh, uh, word Aishwarya and it's also used in some, many other Sanskrit texts. So it's not uh, something used only in Arthashastra, it's also used in many other texts. So whether the words Aishwarya mean sovereignty. So how this uh, word Aishwarya has been used, if we, I will show some examples. For example, it is, uh, both I have taken these examples from uh, Kalidasa. So this is, this is how commonly the word Aishwarya is used in all Sanskrit texts. So in the first example, uh, Nishachara Aishwarya. So Nishacharas are uh, Rakshasas. So he was given by Rajatva Aishwarya of Rakshasas by Rama. Rama gave Aishwarya. Aishwarya means the Rajatva to Vibhishana after the war. That is the meaning of the first sentence. And uh, in the second sentence, uh, the Vikaras emerge in the people who are proud full of wealth. In this se sentence, Aishwarya use in the sense wealth. And there is also in Hindi also, we, I think we use in the same meaning, Aishwarya wealth is a very well-known meaning. The same is also in Sanskrit. And there's one more meaning that is Rajatva. But we don't know what is Rajatva here. It is, whether it is sovereign power, it is difficult to say just by this usage. So then how to understand this word? So, so Aishwarya actually, the word Aishwarya is derived from the word Ishwara. So there are some uh, suffixes which we add in uh, Sanskrit. So Ishwara by adding some, uh, it's called Pratyas, by adding some Pratyas, the Ishwara becomes Aishwarya. So the original word is Ishwara. So whether we can say Ishwara is sovereign in, in Indian tradition, whether we understand Ishwara as some, someone sovereign. If we see the any ancient sutras, like there are Nyaya Sutra, Vaisheshika Sutra, and Mimamsa Sutra, and uh, there's a Sutra of uh, uh, Vedanta Sutras are there, and uh, Yoga Sutras are there, and Sankhya, Karikas and Sutras are now not available, but Sankhya Karikas are there and we have Mahabharata, Ramayana. If we see the discussions in all these texts, 
so it is very difficult to say ishwara is sovereign means his complete authority over everything it's very difficult to say for example i will show some examples let us take this uh, sutra in, is a yoga sutra the first one what yoga sutra says klesha karma vipaka aashayehi apara mrashta purusha visheshah ishwara so ishwara is apara mrashta is not touched by all this klesha there are kleshas avidya raga dvesha these are considered as the kleshas in the yoga tradition so klesha then karma good or bad karma karma vipaka is karma phala what we get by doing karma there is karma vipaka and ashaya so ishwara is aparam rashta asprashta is uh, away from all this uska karma nahi hai karma phal ka samband nahi hai kuch bhi nahi hai aisa purush vishesh ishwar is the meaning of the first sentence and this is from another from bhagavad gita so na kartrutvam na karmani lokas sujati prabhu na karma phala sanyogam so he doesn't give even kartrutva to someone na kartrutvam sujati na karma phala sanyogam he he doesn't give some karma phala because he does, did some karma he gets his phala and because there is ishwara as a sakshi everyone gets the, their phala so not ishwara is deciding what one should get so this is what even bhagavad gita says if we see the discussions in mimamsa they won't accept ishwara also they say karma someone gets karma phala by karma so we don't need any someone like ishwara to get karma phala ishwara himself uh, uh, karma it's by the, by the kar- karma itself gives karma phala so therefore they won't accept ishwara so you can see you can even in other darshanas also the same type of discussions we will find so even if we see the stories that we have like uh, story of basmasura so he gives some some boon uh, to basmasura ishwara gives so then what happens so basmasura tries whether it works or not and ishwara himself and he has to he runs away to someone he goes to vishnu and uh, vishnu takes mohini avatar and somehow he resolves the problem so it is di- very difficult to say our even the paramatma is a co- complete authority supreme authority over everything so all our discussions in all the darshanas are similar to that so then how they tra- if ishwara is difficult to say sovereign then how aishwarya can be translated as sovereignty because if it is not if ishwara is not sovereign then aishwarya cannot be sovereignty but all translators they translated aishwarya sovereignty it it means they found something uh, so it is not some uh, just they translated without understanding it is difficult because shama shastri was some scholar and there was even ganapati shastri was there who later uh, wrote commentary on uh, artha shastra there were many sc- some scholars engaged in this translations so it is very difficult to say they didn't understand sanskrit therefore they translated like this in english is very difficult it is not a proper claim to make so then how they translated Aish, aishwarya as sovereignty so before going into that question let us understand what is sovereignty how because sovereignty is a word and some people in this world can understand that because it is a english term english speaking world can understand what does it mean so how it developed in you can say in europe how the concept of sovereignty developed in europe how they understand that if we know that then we might get some idea how the, this translation could have taken place so therefore first let us see how it it was understood in a particular culture especially in european culture how the concept of sovereignty was discussed let us see that so sovereignty as a concept evolved out of christian theology how the concept of creator god is a central idea in christian theology and by the virtue of being a creator he is outside this cosmos because he is a creator he is outside this cosmos and as the creator of the cosmos and the creatures he has the supreme authority to command his creatures to act according to his will this is the reason why he is called the sovereign he is a creator and he can his will is a law so the will of creator god is law so everyone has to follow the law therefore he is a supreme authority over all being everything he is a supreme authority over everything so the, and in the bible also we will find similar sentence let everyone be subject to the governing authorities 
for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Therefore, they can, they can be punished. If they are against the law, against the will of God, so they can be punished. So then, so the discussion of this sovereignty so is uh, evolved, and uh, the institution of church was developed to oversee institutionalization of Christian way of being in the world as part of church's duty to carry out God's authority. So this is how uh, church got this authority to control uh, people. And uh, later on, church, which was hierarchically stratified institution, was constituted to guide the believers according to the revelation of the God and to regulate them as well. In this way, the church got the authority. So, the God was considered sovereign initially. And uh, later on, so this uh, controlling this authority means because the church was the, uh, some institution to guide people, so it also drew authority and uh, it was also, uh, so the, uh, what, the concept of sovereignty partially, sh uh, can say, shifted, can, whether we can say it's, uh, it's partially shifted to this uh, institution called church. So then there was a discussion in uh, Europe. So is divine law greater than laws of men? Whether divine law is greater or secular laws are greater. So this discussion we will find in Europe. So church was argued that divine law is greater than secular laws. This is how the church extended itself into the sphere of political authority. So because of discussion, the church became the highest authority to discuss on everything. Uh, so decide on everything, even on secular laws, what one has to do. Uh, because everything should be accordance, in accordance with Christian doctrines. So even the secular laws should also be in accordance with Christian doctrines. So therefore, church became highest authority to decide everything. So it became established that the secular laws should be in, a, here it's, yeah, in, the, in accordance with divine laws. The church started authorizing the kings and kingdoms which followed the law system based on Christian doctrines. It was at this point of time the kings who were authorized by church were started to be called monarchs. So monarchs are those who are authorized by church to rule. They are called monarchs. Therefore, we can say they are supreme authorities because they got authority from the church to rule these people. So over a period of time, monarchs was himself called a sovereign. This is how the concept clusters of Christian theology became part of the politics and governance. So it started with Christian theology. Later on, it, it uh, evolved. Even it uh, covered the domain of politics. So by 12th century, monarchs had started to rule over a self-defined territory. Here, many people started questioning the authority of church. Slowly, the authority of monarch went on increasing in the secular world. So initially, church was the supreme authority. But later on, so because of internal conflicts, so monarchs became supreme authority. You can see in the, maybe in uh, uh, this, who is George, someone in the, uh, England? who he started the Church of England, so against this. Uh, uh, so this, there were conflicts between uh, whether, whether this okay, monarchs have supreme authority or not, whether they have to follow the church or not. So these conflicts were there in Europe. So that later on, this development took place. And, and because of this, all these conflicts, these nation states evolved. So kings created and used institutions like parliament to effectively rule over the people. Over the period of time, the concept of nation state emerged in the secular realm. The state replaced the God. So then the nation states evolved around 16th century. And uh, so because it became secular, later on this uh, concept of God was replaced by the state. So state replaced the God. Therefore, we call state is sovereign today. So this God is not there in this discussion. But uh, the state has sovereignty. State is sovereign. This is how the concept evolved. So therefore, this Zenin says, the substance of divine sovereignty can be presented in a broader way as different manifestation of God's sovereignty in excess of his power, in delegation of his power to others, in excess of his mercy, and in the excess of his love. Many of these ideas have been developed in the modern doctrine of constitutional law. 
the institution institute of pardon traces its origin to god's mercy the set of legal regulations that establish exclusively positive legal statutes can be traced back to god's grace and the modern state on the whole aspires to divine almightiness by developing the image of an omnipotent state in the public consciousness so you can see for example institution of pardon traces its origin to god's mercy for example rashtrapati can give kshamadana so why he can give kshamadana because he represents state so state is sovereign he represents state therefore he can give kshamadana and uh, we can see in, in the jaina parampara they have this uh, salekhana vrata and so now they have to take permission from state even to do salekhana vrata why they have to take permission because state has uh, supreme authority or or violence also so they can't uh, do violence on their own body so state has the supreme authority therefore they have to take permission from state so this supreme the concept of supreme authority is comes from this uh, these developments now state replaces god and therefore we can't trace it back means we don't know uh, how it developed from christian theology but actually it comes from christian theology and just the god replaces this uh, the state replaces god so now just is a broad discussion because it took around 2000 years to evolve uh, this concepts into and uh, to enter into politics and to evolve into this uh, to say it is nation or state is a sovereign to come to this stage there were it took around 2000 years so many discussion took place in this uh, in th- so many years but just uh, this bro- broadly i showed what happened in europe and the question we started is how the translators translated aishwarya as sovereignty that was the question and now we know how it developed in europe and the basically the sovereign the concept of sovereignty is related with god so because he is a creator god he is sovereign so now the question is how ishwara is under how the word ishwara is translated as sovereign and how aishwarya as sovereignty so the only way to say how they might have translated how they might have translated in aishwarya as sovereignty is if one does not recognize this cultural difference then there is a possibility of equating ishwara with god because ishwara is also somehow we connect with uh, something para so there is a po- possibility if because there is a concept of god and there is also something para is discussed in the indian traditions so if we can equate between god and ishwara and we can say okay it's, it's some similar concept god and ishwara are something similar then only because god is sovereign we can say ishwara is also sovereign and then there, there will be a possibility that translating aishwarya as uh, aishwarya sovereignty because ishwara is sovereign we can say aishwarya we can translate aishwarya as sovereignty this is the only possibility of translating aishwarya sovereignty only by equating ishwara with god we can do that so as we know god is sovereign in christianity ishwara becomes sovereign and the word aishwarya becomes sovereignty so the translation problems here emerged based on ignorance of cultural difference so because as we discussed if we see indian traditions it is very difficult to say the ishwara is sovereign in our tradition it can be any darshana nyaya yoga sankhya in any darshan it is very difficult to say but when europeans because though shama shastri translated it into english so already there was discussion already there were dictionaries written and i will show an example see this is uh, uh, mills and h wilson they wrote this uh, dictionary it was uh, around 1830 uh, so this dictionary was written so this was written so proposed version of theological terms with a view to unfo- uniformity in translation of holy scripture etc into various languages of india so they thought sanskrit will be very useful to translate bible into various uh, indian languages so therefore they first tried to translate uh, biblical terms into sanskrit so this is one of the example here this is the lord and uh, original word in hebrew and uh, how it is understood is a remark on that 
and the proposed Sanskrit word for Lord. So here, he, the, these are the, some of the words he uses. Isha, Ishvara, Parameshvara, Shambhu, Swayambhu. And this can be appropriate word in Sanskrit to translate uh, Lord. So this is what the, the initial discussion, because initially they started translate, uh, translating Bibles into various languages. And this is how dictionaries also came up. And so because of this, uh, uh, because they couldn't differentiate between cultures. So since they thought the, these concepts are common in everywhere. So the concept like, uh, uh, like Lord or uh, God, these concepts are common in everywhere. And so there can be little bit differences because uh, it can be a pale variant or it can be uh, so some type, some variant of the same concept, but the, all these concepts are common everywhere. In all cultures, these concepts are common. Therefore, they thought it is possible to translate these terms into Sanskrit. And this is an example. This is how they try to understand. So yeah, so theological concepts was like this, and in, in secular. When it became secular, the God was replaced, the state was replaced with God. So all these concepts are the same. The concept cluster is same. Just we won't find God in these discussions today. So, but if we see Arthashastra, there are different concepts. I mean, the different cluster is there in Arthashastra. For example, we'll find Aishwarya, Vibhu, Danda, Dharma, Raja. These are these belong to different concept concept cluster. And God, sovereignty, law, mercy, citizenship, authority, these are different concept clusters. So these are two different concept clusters. And what happened in this uh, translation is, so the Ishwara, which, is, which belongs to different concept cluster, was brought and tried, they tried to understand this concept Ishwara with these ideas, with the help of these ideas. So when Ishvara came here, means is, which belongs to a different concept cluster, uh, was, re, was tried to understand with these references, then this, the original reference which it had, it, it lost. Because we don't, now it's lost, the, because it, it can only be understood with some different concept clusters. As, we, as I discussed, Danda, etc. There are many other concepts, Vibhu and uh, Akarta, there are many other concepts are references with with the help of which we can understand what is Ishwara. But now because of this translation what happened? So we are trying to understand the concepts, the concept of Ishwara and Aishwarya, everything with some different references. So, so modern day understanding of Arthashastra is based on these European concept clusters. They are trying to understand Arthashastra with European concept clusters or basically Christian concept clusters. So now we are trying to understand, means if you see discussions of P.V. Kane or Histerman or uh, even of Romila Thapar, even of Patrick Oliver, if you see all these discussions, they are trying to understand Arthashastra with these concept clusters. And they are imposing it on Sanskrit words. But now the question, whether anyone recognized this concept concept of sovereignty wasn't there, was not there in, the, in Indian politics. Does anyone recognize this or is this just a theoretical discussion are we doing? So for example, Patrick Oliver himself ha had this insight. See, he, this is the introduction he wrote to Panchatantra. So Panchatantra is considered as a one of uh, uh, text which uh, uh, summarizes all the text like Arthashastra. So any text on politics, the summary of all political texts related to politics. This was Panchatantra, the first sloka of Panchatantra says. And uh, he wrote is an introduction written by Patrick Oliver. Here he says, the kings in Panchatantra are depicted as by and large weak, timid and stupid. What they would do without the strong guiding hand of a wise and experienced minister is anybody's guess. 
So every king we encounter is depicted as helpless and totally under the control of its ministers. So he has in the inside that the if we see discussions in Panchatantra, the king is not sovereign. He doesn't have this complete authority. But he himself in the translation of Arthashastra, in the introduction of Arthashastra, he says king was sovereign. Arthasha, this Panchatantra is summary of Arthashastra. Here he himself recognizes he, he was not sovereign. So this contradiction which we find in the introduction of Patrick Olival is because he tried to understand with different concept clusters and because he tried to understand with different concept clusters, he couldn't recognize that. The sovereignty, the supreme authority, he couldn't find anything. Therefore, he is saying he is using some different words, his timid, helpless, so king was like that. So this is how he is describing. And even in the 18th century, when Europeans came into India, so this is one of the historian writes, historians of law and European empires have shown how the search for sovereignty created unique problem in British India. They couldn't find the, con the concept of sovereignty in India. They had huge, they ran into huge problem because they had to uh, do many uh, engagements, means there should be, what we can say, uh, yeah, treatises, agreements with Indian kings. And they ran into huge problem because they couldn't find who, who, who has the sovereignty, who has the authority, power. So, yeah, see the, the politics that possessed and yet did not possess sovereignty, this is how they described. It is very difficult to say whether it has sovereignty or not. This is how, in the, even in the 18th century, Europeans described about Indian politics. So, therefore, they used words like divided sovereignty, quasi-sovereignty. So, these words they used even in the 18th century. So, it is very difficult to say the concept of sovereignty existed in Arthashastra. And till, even till the 18th century, it was not there. But whoever translated or whoever discussed on Arthashastra, they found that this concept exists in Arthashastra. And they did translations and uh, they wrote books on, and books and many, many books on uh, concept of ancient Indian politics is based on these translations. So this is one example from Arthashastra. So I will take another example from uh, Bhagavad Gita. So there is a famous shloka, Stri Shudushtasu Varshneya Jayate Varana Sankaraha. This is a very well, well known shloka and this very means is uh, discussed by many people. So the meaning of this sloka is Krishna, when wise prevails, the women of the family become unchaste. The corruption of the women leads to a mixture of varnas. So I took one example of Nicholas, but uh, all translations translate just uh, in the background of sexual intercourse. If you see in uh, because in 1784 the Asiatic Society started in Calcutta. Next year itself, the Gita was translated into English. So from there onwards, everyone translates this, uh, this verse in the background of sexual intercourse. It is common. So, and many, based on these translations, different interpretations were also created on Indian society, also written in on Indian society. For example, so to keep women under control was one of the ways of preserving the caste system intact. That is to protect the purity of the upper caste. Lower caste men were not allowed to have sexual contact with upper caste women, which was controlled institutionally because the Brahmanical text, that is same, Bhagavad Gita, uh, declared that if one let loses the control, the social system would collapse. This is how it interpreted the, based on these translations. The purity of caste system has been hailed in the Gita because of the Gita says, without caste, the humanity would lose the precious standards of sexual decorum. And this is again, third one, the sloka dis disapproves intercaste marriages and according to the sloka, intercaste marriages would lead people to hell. Krishna took his avatar to protect humankind from intercaste marriages. Yada yada hi dharmasya, he told. So why, uh, what he wants to protect? <laughs> he wants to protect intercaste marriage. <laughs> the hierarchical structure of Hindu society had patriarchal system and women were seen as inferior beings. So all these interpretations are based on this translation of Bhagavad Gita. So now the, let us see how traditional scholars understood this sloka. 
because it is in Bhagavad Gita and from around from 6th century onwards. So we will find uh, Bhashyas on uh, Bhagavad Gita. So our commentaries are there, how they try to understand. But the interesting thing is, see we looked into all commentaries of Bhagavad Gita from 7th century onwards, it begins with 7th century and no one commented on this loka. So Shankaracharya, then Ramakanta, Bhatta, it includes from Kashmirians through Kanyakumari. Shankaracharya was considered as uh, Keralian and uh, some were from uh, Kashmir, uh, like uh, Bhatta Bhaskara and Abhinav Gupta, they were Kashmirians. So no one commented on this loka. So Bhatta Bhaskara, Abhinav Gupta and Ananda Vardhana, Ramanujacharya, Madhvacharya, Anandagiri, Jayatirtha, Vallabhacharya, Sridhar Swami. So if you see all traditions are there, Madhva tradition is there, Ramanujacharya tradition is there, Vallabha tradition is there. So no one tradition commented on this particular shloka. And when it begins from 15th century onwards, even Sanskrit scholars started commenting on this particular shloka. And but though they, they commented, you will find some interesting commentary in this. Uh, some uh, someone Nilakanta here he says about, it is about in sexual intercourse. Dufta, so having sexual intercourse with another Varna. We don't know about Hanumat Parsha Chabasya, is also around 15th century. Again, here also he says Dufta is related he, in the background of sexual intercourse. And then Madhusudana Saraswati, one of the well known scholar. And he, see, interesting thing is. Asma bhi api epichare krate kaha doshaha iti kutarka hataha. Our husbands have done kulakshaya, abandoning dharma. So, what is wrong in we involving in vipichara or women becoming dhrta? See, here he, what he says so, our husbands have abandoned dharma. So, what is wrong even if we abandon dharma? So it is difficult whether it is related to sexual intercourse or not. So it is very difficult to say from this uh, Sanskrit commentary. Because since our husbands left dharma, they are not following dharma. So hum bhi dharma ka palan nahi karenge, itna, itna hi artha hai iska. Since because of these translations today we have, we, we in the background of that we can say okay, it is also related to sexual intercourse. Otherwise by these sentences, it's very difficult to come into that, uh, get that meaning. And there's another option he also gives, another interpretation. He says, Dushta living with their husbands who are themselves denigrated due to Kulakshaya. So, Kulakshaya kari patita pati sammandhat. The, the pati, husbands are patita. Because uh, sammandha, because they are with the patita pati. The, the denigrated uh, husbands, these are also called dushta. So here even he is not saying striya, strees are dushtas. Because the patis are dushtas, even strees are called dushtas. This is how he commenting on this uh, particular sentence. And same with Sadananda also. He also, this, if you find this even sentence is the same. Both Madhusudan Saraswati and uh, Sadananda. And, uh, if we say Purushottama, again he says Vibhichara, but it is not clear what is Vibhichara because today we have a particular meaning to this word Vibhichara, but it was not this uh, this meaning. Means uh, if we say Vibhichara, is, is, uh, we say it is about sexual intercourse. Today it is used in that only, only in particular sense, but it was not used in that sense uh, in any shastra, any darshan or shastra, you won't find this particular, the, the meaning which is prevailing today was not there in uh, Nyaya, Visankhya, Vaisheshika, in any darshan, this, this meaning was not there. So, if we see the initial translations, no one translated till 15th century. So, from 15th century, we will find uh, some uh, commentaries, Sanskrit commentaries. And if we see these commentaries, minimally there were two options. Some understood in the background of sexual intercourse, and some didn't understood it in the background of something else, not following dharma, in that sense they understood. So it was not related with sexual intercourse. So when Europeans interest, when Europeans start, started translating Bhagavad Gita, minimally there were two options in front of them. Either we can, either they could have said with, uh, in the back, they could have translated it in the background of sexual intercourse, or they could have translated in the background of not following dharma in, in that sense. But what made them to choose particular type of translate particular uh, uh, type of yeah so what made them to choose particular 
commentary, particular type of commentaries as something authority. So something which had, which they had in their cultural experience helped them to decide a particular meaning. There were two options. So there should be something to decide, no? Because it's not about one scholar. Everyone, every European translated similarly. Everyone translated in the background of sexual intercourse. So there should be something familiar in their culture which helped them to translate in the background of sexual intercourse. So if we see the discussions in Europe, so we will find they had some cultural background to, to choose one type of uh, translation or one type of Vyakyanas uh, as authentic to, or, uh, to translate this particular shloka. Okay, even, see, even this uh, Wilson, who wrote first uh, Sanskrit English Dictionary, and uh, Monier Williams, who, who was a student of Wilson, and both, they say when the word in feminine, this has a particular meaning. So, Vanton, Harlot, and even here he says, Unchaste Woman. So, this particular meaning entered, even in the dictionaries, because they only wrote dictionaries, so, their cultural background helped them choose a particular meaning and the same meaning entered the dictionaries also. So, both wrote dictionaries and even Indians followed that later on. So, what was their, see, if you see the discussions about women in Europe, so the West had developed a very specific perception about the position of women in their culture. So, for example, is one of the Ten Commandments. So, you should not commend adultery. So, one of the so, ten commandments are there. So, one of the ten commandments is you should not do adultery. Or you ought not, I think, you ought not uh, do adultery. The highs of discussion about the position of women can be seen in 19th century Victorian morality. There are manifold discussions about women's chastity, which was revered, and contempt towards women who commit adultery. So, if we see 19th century discussions in Europe, so you will find so the Victorian morality was a uh, well -known famous word to describe uh, the discussions. So, so the reverence was given to a particular type of, so who, who was uh, who followed chastity. The reverence was given to them and uh, who are doing and uh, the what the word Vesha today was. So the contempt toward uh, prostitution and contempt toward those women were uh, committing adultery, so that we will find that the, the such discussions we will find in Europe. So, so when they came to India and tried to understand the Indian texts, so they had some background, the cultural background, so cultural ideas were there. So that helped them to choose particular type of words to translate. So background of European culture regarding the position of women helped them to describe women's status in India. So I will show a picture. So can you identify which uh, god is this? <laughs> so see, this is the, this image is based on the description given by Vartama, an Italian traveler who writes about the king of Calicut. The king of Calicut is a pagan and worships the devil in the manner you shall hear. That is what he writes in his uh, book. And this image is based on the description of worship he was doing. So, he, so this is the image of a god. So he was worshipping. And uh, this image is based on this description. So then who might be? Can you guess? Huh? Garuda. Okay, any other guess? So whom we do puja? So some, he was doing puja of some devata, and based on this uh, description given by Vartama, someone wrote this uh, image. So it's actually in Rasimha. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he was doing Narasimha puja. Ah. So, and Vardhamma described this Satyam Puja, and this image is based on this description. 
so it is very difficult to say it is narasimha so we won't find any similarity here but they had some cultural background that helped vardhama to see narasimha puja as devil worship see he was not doing devil worship the king was not doing devil worship he was doing some devata puja but the ba cultural background of vartama helped him to see the the puja of narasimha as devil worship and uh, if we see this image it is it is impossible to say he was doing some narasimha puja it is something completely uh, so even can't we can't infer who was that so this is how the cultural background of europeans help them to understand in, even in indian text this is just an example how they understood puja of narasimha same happened when they tried to translate indian texts also or when they tried to understand indian culture so so, so uh, yeah so which one yeah text is available is online available the whole description which he was given so europeans understood indian culture in the background of their cultural experience so it gives us an idea of european culture but but not about india does this image give any idea about indian culture nothing what we can infer we can infer only about european culture there is nothing about indian culture in this image same with the translations also so this translations gives an we can understand european culture by these translations so by the translation of artha shastra by the translation of bhagavad gita what we can understand why Euro we can ask the question why europeans translated like this this can be a question the, we can't ask what we can get how what understanding we can get about bhagavad gita artha shastra we can't get anything as we can't understand anything about devata we can't understand anything about artha shastra or gita by reading these translations i will give another one more last example then i will conclude this is from uh, chandogya upanishad and uh, is related to very famous story of satyakama jabala and uh, if you see all the available resources about satyakama jabala i selected some of the resources so this is in wikipedia you can open and uh, see now itself so satyaka what he i think you are, all of you know the story of satyakama jabala so satyakama jab jabala jabala was mother of satyakama and uh, satyakama goes uh, to his uh, teacher and uh, the teacher asks so what is your gotra to satyakama then satyakama says uh, then he goes back to his uh, mother and asks what is my gotra then she says i don't know your gotra but i can you can you say you are satyakama jabala son of jabala therefore you can say satya I, i am satyakama jabala so just say that so because i don't know the gotra then he goes back and uh, uh, he says to his guru that i am satyakama jabala and I, i don't know my gotra this is the story which is in chandogya upanishad and how this is understood so if you see this uh, uh, satyakama replies that he is of uncertain parentage because his mother did not know who the father is so what what they are assuming so she was like prostitute uh, so she didn't know who the father is because he worked she worked in many places she was uh, like maid she was working in uh, many houses and she didn't know who the father is and therefore she didn't say the go what gotra to what gotra he belongs this is how the wikipedia says so this is another example is some international website so satyakama replies that he is uncertain parentage because his mother does not know who his father is and this is some hindi uh, hindi log hain iske hindi se ek uh, copy kiya uh, beta satyakam mein yuva thi tab anek gharon mein dasi ke roop mein kaam karti thi उस समय उसी समय तुम्हारा जन्म हुआ तुम दासी पुत्र हो तुम्हारा तुम्हारे पिता का नाम भी मुझे ज्ञात नहीं है लीव द गोत्र यू आर आई डोंट नो नेम ऑफ माय फादर यू आर फादर एंड यू आर दासी पुत्र शी डिक्लेयर्स दैट दिस इज द 
uh, this we will find here and is some of uh, ramakrishna mission some yeah some branch she didn't know who satyakama's father was she had never been married satyakama was an illegitimate child so even they say he was not married and she was uh, maid and uh, satyakama was illegitimate child therefore she didn't know gotra this is what we find in in all the websites everywhere you will find this is the uh, how, how did the story was described now let us see what this because it is there in upanishad so let us see what the upanishad says how, and how traditional scholars understood this uh, particular uh, mantra of upanishad oh even before that yeah even tagore wrote a poem based on this so the early rays of the sun glittered on the tree tops of the forest hermitage the student with their tangled hair still wet with their morning bath sat sat under the ancient tree before the master there came satyakama he bowed low at the feet of the sage and stood silent tell me the great teacher asked him of what clan are thou my lord he answered i know it not my mother said when i asked her i had served many masters in my youth and though didst come to the mother jabala's arm who had no husband and at the end he says okay the there there rose a murmur like the angry hum of bees disturbed in their hive and the students muttered at the shameless insolence of that outcast this is how he says means he was he saying he is outcast yeah. and uh, she didn't know uh, who her husband was this is how everyone understood this mantra and uh, is all this and also it's all based on this translations let us see how it was understood by traditional scholars so shankaracharya wrote commentary on this particular mantra and uh, though madhvacharya didn't uh, wrote commentary in madhva tradition raghavendra tirtha wrote commentary on this and in uh, ramanuja tradition ranga navanuja wrote a bhashya on this so till 17th century everyone understood in a particular way everyone translate and uh, wrote vyakya in a particular way so to understand how they translate how they understood how they commented this uh, this uh, english translation is very helpful so because here is a uh, during my youth when i got the i was engaged in attending on many bracket guests who frequently frequented the house of my husband and had no opportunity of making any enquiry on the subject i know not of what gotra you are jabala is my name and satyakama the so everyone till 17th century commented that she was in her husband's house and because husband died in very engaged and she was busy in uh, doing sar serving many atithis so she didn't know gotra this is how everyone till 17th century commented this uh, particular mantra so even in uh, even this first translation he did uh, he translated into english even this translation he he translated in similar way therefore he wrote in bracket house of my husband so everything he wrote so when this changed because you know if you see all these translations we is we wouldn't understand how this in the uh, wikipedia and all other because there they won't say she was in uh, husband's house they are saying she was uh, she was uh, serving many masters and she didn't know who who was her husband so this description we will find then how it began there's a question see it begins with max muller so in 1879 he translates it in my youth when i had to move about much as a servant waiting on the guests in my father's house i conceived thee so he changed a diff so, so instead of saying so she was in uh, husband's house he says so waiting on the guests in my father's house i was a servant and i was in my father's house i was serving many people around and boy uh, serving many people i got you so from someone i don't know therefore i don't, don't know the gotra this is how max muller translates this and then paul translates again he was maid servant and uh, sc basu so he had some problem therefore he says is poster child of jabala and uh, there is a note on that and uh, hume 
again says she was a maid. Ganganatha, the Sanskrit scholar, there is a Ganganatha Jha Parisara in the Rakshi Sanskrit Samstan. So he also says, as a servant, I conceived thee. Though he knew Sanskrit, he says the same thing. And Swami Shivananda says, maid servant, I conceived thee. Prahant Swami, Prabhavananda and Patrick, they are also translated the same. And uh, the recent translation of Patrick Olival says, I was, made, I was made and had a lot of relationships. So it's, he, for him, it's very clear now. Because he's a recent translation, he says, I had a lot of relationships, I was a maid. And he refers German translation. He says, what is the source for this? He refers German translations again. So in German translation, it is translated like this and they are referring the same to translate it into English. So in the last around 200 years, so these new translations, so no one till 17th century means 1500 years in our tradition, no one understood this particular mantra in this way. Everyone in, in each all parampara, they understood this mantra as, so he, she was uh, in her husband's house. There's only one Vyakhyana we will get. But from this translation onwards, so everyone translated into English and they translated, even Sanskrit scholars translated, she was a maid. And she was uh, serving many masters. And today we use the same story to say about Indian, edu Indian education. How Indian education was there and for everyone, we, we, we were giving education to everyone because he said truth. Even uh, though he was a Dasi Putra, he said truth because of them, this uh, Guru gave uh, Jnana to this Dasi Putra also. So for everyone, we were giving education. So this story, this story is based on translation. Uh, and also it's, also it's, the European trans it's based on European translation, based on st this story. Even nationalists are arguing we were giving education to everyone. So even that entered into dictionary. So if you say search online kosha, then it says paricharini made. So no other meaning today. So only one meaning is available. So what they did, so there is a word in Sanskrit, this paricharini. So how Indian scholars understood till 17th century, paricharini means doing save of uh, atiti. And even we can understand this because many people will come to our house and uh, usually uh, wives and uh, they do uh, whatever they need, they will give, uh, arrange some food and everything. So this, uh, even uh, every house we will understand this. Paricharan means doing seva of atithis. But this translator, English translators, what they did, how they understood Paricharan is made. They translated Paricharan as a maid and the whole translation later on, they use the same word. And now, even in the dictionary, there's the same word is used, and paricharan is made. No, no, the standard is. So, what we will understand by these translations? Do we understand anything about Chandogya Upanishad? No. We can only say, or we can only infer, how European culture was there, while Max Muller was translating. So, what made him? What are the cultural, what are the concepts he had, while translating this particular text into English. So we can only infer something about European culture, nothing about Euro Chandogya Upanishad. Because in Europe, so maids, the word maids in Middle English used to unmarried virgin and were female domestic workers, especially in Germany, England and France. So they had particular idea about, about uh, maids and domestic service was one of the second largest occupation in 19th century Europe. After agriculture, maids were the uh, means domestic work and even in domestic work, mo most of them were maids and uh, young age women were uh, working as maids in Europe. Most of them were young women and they were highly dependent upon their employers and also fell into prostitution. So this idea that they had in their cultural experience helped them to translate a mantra of Chandogya Upanishad and today that became the standard in all the discussions about Chandogya Upanishad and even for a nationalist the same uh, translation became standard they're using the same story so now we, if we go back to the question that we had in the beginning do the translations provide appropriate understanding of text what do you think now any understanding of text let us <laughs> Uh, improve the question. Appropriate, any understanding of the text. Let us take an example of Artha Shastra or uh, Bhagavad Gita and the third is Chandogya Upanishad. Can we get anything about Chandogya Upanishad, Artha Shastra or Bhagavad Gita? Nothing. We can understand why these translations were made. 
how Europeans, what are the concepts Europeans had while doing this translation. If we ask this question, we, may get, we might get some answer. But if you ask what we can understand by these translations, what we can understand about Arthashastra and other texts, it's very difficult to say. So, if we agree with translations, then we will have to agree that the contemporary discourse about India is true. But now what happened? On the contrary, if we say the contemporary discourse about India is problematic, then translations must have huge problem and there are huge problems. Therefore, the contemporary discourse also has, it can be a nationalist or it can be any can. Anyone might have doing discussion, but the discussions are all based on these translations and these translations also have huge problems. Because this, all these translations are, connect, are based on the concept clusters or co commonplace ideas that Europeans had. So they translated with the help of, with the background of commonplace ideas that they had and the commonplace ideas of Europeans, now because of these trans translations, it seems as if familiar to us, though it's not familiar, we are thinking they are very familiar ideas to us and we are also following the same. So this is the, so this is how, so yesterday we discussed about the problems of translations, how the, what happens if idea migrates from one culture to so another culture, what are the problems it creates. So we can see the huge problems that are created in the, especially in social sciences and uh, when we discuss about, mainly about Sanskrit texts. Okay, thanks very much. Now let me, let me come back quickly. Now one can go on debating about the notion of Ishwara in Indian tradition, there are different uh, uh, issues about uh, how to make sense of it. Different traditions have different explanation. Now, this was not the problem to explicate the notion of Ishwara. The question was very specific in the sense that if the way God is sovereign, in order to be sovereign, you know, he should have, he should be a creator God and he should have Kartritva, agency. You know, there are a whole range of properties that are being ascribed to make God into a sovereign, right? Question, irrespective of which notion of Ishwara that you debate. Okay, specifically, you see, when Arthashastra was written, if you tentatively ascribe the time period as something like 2nd century BC, and that was the time you have some Upanishads available, you have Mimamsa, you have early exposition. Vedanta was not even formed, right? Then you had Naya Sutra and other. What do they discuss? Now, it is not even about the entirety of what Ishwara is about. Question, if you use the notion of Ishwara, for example, can we talk, ascribe karma phala to Ishwara? That's the question when Arthashastra was written. Ishwara doesn't give karma phala, he can at the maximum be sakshi, because if he say he gives karma phala, he becomes karta. Now, our tradition forbids Ishwara being karta, because he doesn't do anything. Okay, so there are very serious discussion whether, see he is Nabhokta, he doesn't consume anything, he doesn't help you to consume anything, you have to do all that, he is in the Sakshi. Now that is how the discussion of Ishwara. So in order to invoke the notion of sovereign to Ishwara, you need to have minimal properties that are necessary to qualify Ishwara to be sovereign. Now is that possible was a simple question. Now, then what is our notion of Ishwara? That's an entirely different question. It's a much larger question, in fact. That's a question by itself is very interesting. But if you see the description, so he can't do anything. It's a Simma. If you see the Pachadantra story, was not some, he didn't have any authority over those bodies. But he's not a Vishwara. 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 He's not a in the sense, a God who is the creator God. You get me one example, then we will talk about it. Uh, you can say Sarveshwara. No, you can, one of the best illustration of that is if you read something like Nirvan Shetka. Shankara, an extraordinary poem. Now there, 
there is a description of vibhu vibhutva cha sarvatra sarvendriyana right now what does he do vibhu nacha sangato he doesn't do anything it goes on no 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 can he be qualified to a sovereign straight question now ishwara can have potentially whether he can do theoretically i mean these are not useful to me because if a king has to be sovereign and aishwarya is a notion which gives him the authority for example in court of law we ask this question what gives constitution an authority to do this particular action ha huh. i mean not just sovereignty there are other many but sovereign is a one of the very important force now the king to have certain authority right what gives him that power right now he has to draw his power because of the x y or z reasons now whether this notion of ishwara facilitates you to draw that and the answer is absolute no now if you say that there is such a thing in the time when arthashastra was written if you can say it would be a good refutation of my idea if you can bring out an evidence through which you can say this notion of ishvara had that properties which are very similar to a sovereign the creator god very similar then it would be a good refutation of our claim then you can say arthashastra is the book of state craft that that continues to hold so our hypothesis is that you don't have it okay tilak showed a very small snapshot of what is this our resources are much wider than what we have seen so if you can come up with one instance for instance that would be a good refutation no, i mean even if you little data of fifth century you please bring it and we will be happy to get our hypothesis refuted and one of the best test of any good hypothesis is to refute it and we would like our hypothesis to be refuted okay i mean we would want it i mean we have been having lots of discussion over this so simply the idea question is that what makes aishwarya into sovereign because many people who translated it whether shama shastri kangle ganpati shastri or the patrick oliver and even some more have used this notion of aishwarya to translate sovereignty therefore infer that arthashastra was a book of state craft see in order if you say you wanted to say this is bo- this book is about state formation of state so historians for example the romila tapper's work lineage to state a very famous powerful book which is available which actually trace, traces how states started getting formed in india she has an entire theory around it which is a very popular notion and invariably all these discussions whether it is indology sanskritis or the historians arthashastra becomes the flag point to see the state craft formation in india right now can you infer remotely a possibility of state in arthashastra now there are multiple things for example state should re- have monopoly over violence state should have a sovereign structure so many indologists run into they recognize the problem that we are pointing out so one of the route that they take is ha india the king was not really sovereign in the way that he is sovereign that's how the discussion goes because otherwise if you don't invoke notion of sovereignty and monopoly over violence you cannot show that there existed a state so whether chanakya rajya whatever it could be about whether it deals with state or not becomes a fundamental question and the answer in the mainstream is yes it is about the state now the moment you say okay if it is about state what kind of state there are different kinds of state that people talk about a modern state is not the only state there are different states now does it qualify any fundamental core property of what makes it into a state and the answer is if you read arthashastra arthashastra disqualifies everything that could make it rajya into a state that much i can tell you now then what is rajya this is a question to be investigated we don't know was raja monarch absolutely not it is forbidden no then what raja is what is the role of raja we don't know what it is we need to investigate and was it the only model to look at politics of india are there other practical for was it just a book 
are there any other practical i mean all these questions are open it looks like the kautilyan model of looking at rajya have traveled for about 15 to 1700 years more it looks like now i can't very uh, convincingly argue for that but one of the problem that i am trying to put is to understand indian politics whether it is relevant today not relevant today i don't know ancient indian politics medieval indian politics whatever you wanted to you wanted to understand it what was it like if you want to understand the biggest problem is translation because you actually transform every damn thing into the clusters which is nothing to do with it he showed in the picture suddenly ishwara you know which is in the cluster of you have you know this notion of danda vibhu you know kartrutva there are so many other things from there you pluck that and put into this cluster where you have sovereign violence church state i mean blah 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 in between you put it and it, you get a very distorted picture and uh, i mean the lot of archival data tells us that the british officers had great problem they assumed and came and they wanted to sign treaties with people in india so we thought it was a very easy job for them in parliament they were under tremendous tension they had to they were answerable to british parliament of their days so they have to say that these things are not moving in india because they don't know what kind of agreement to be written with different king with one king the generator format and other king is a very different thing that's why if you look at the number of terms that they used quasi sovereignty tribal sovereignty partial sovereignty incomplete sovereignty incipient sovereignty i, I these are not my creation these are the terms that people used to describe what was the status of princely states in india they were under tremendous problem i mean ishwara could mean many more things it could be true the we can't exhaust ishwara by just looking at one or two property there is much more comprehensive way of you should look at ishwara but we were not really examining the question of ishwara panchatantra the author himself claimed that is the illustration of arthashastra in simple language that means whatever come emerges out of panchatantra should be the replica of what is there in arthashastra it is except for simple narration because arthashastra is a complex treatise so this is not such a comp because your story is it simple now if that were to be the case the same person patrick olivelle who edited both the texts now if it is the illustration of arthashastra that is what the authors have been doing then he should have seen the same image of the king in both the texts right when he writes the introduction the first he showed that he the king of arthashastra is an absolute monarch is the description and second he writes the he makes the critical edition of panchatantra and then he say this king is a helpless timid king now in one book which is the same thing then you say he is an absolute monarch another side he is timid that means that there is some problem in understanding the text this is the point now how king function so both panchatantra and arthashastra the functionalities of the king not just similar they are identical rather what you don't understand in arthashastra if you want some clarification go to panchatantra you will actually get it clarified you get insights into how to look at it and king function raja to make it more clear raja had to function with different kinds of people and arthashastra goes on to the greater detail and saying who are his mitra who are his shatrus who sh who he should sh uh, you know trust on so there is ashtanga so there are different kinds of people whom you should consider whom you should listen to what you should do and panchatantra is just a illustration of that component of what raja should function so what is the in the slides are happening is that he is seeing two different things in two different texts when he was supposed to see only one so that's my point i'm not sure whether my answer solved your problem or not you can still continue to talk Existed, right? No, no. In fact, the kings were not that powerful. In fact, the 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 strangest phenomena that has happened in terms of the uh, rajas, Indian people were confused. Was the kind of power the uh, when the sultanate was established, when they started exercising, it was very unfamiliar to Indian populace. And the Mughal kings were more powerful. 
I mean, the ordinary kings were really till about 14, 15 centuries. They didn't exercise those power. Of course, they had some kind of a power, danda. They had some something which functioned very differently from the notion of sovereign. Now, it didn't have anything remotely. How did danda function? Who used to give punishment, for example, to people? How it worked is a very different notion. And he, I mean, you could not ask this question from where did he draw his authority? The way in any constitutional structure you ask, or in monarchy you ask that question, you cannot ask such question on Danda. In fact, we are writing about it in greater detail. In next one year, we'll be publishing most of our stuff on that. And Arthashastra is very, very clear about what it is. So, the way he had presented using translation, there is a very small part of the bigger story. It's much more sharper and clear if you actually start engaging with it. Okay. Now, the, the last question to... Oh, that's a question to you. I mean, this is a whole thing that we will, we will discuss about because there is a lot of interesting things. But what was the roles and function of a Raja? And what was the notion of Praja? And how did they function is completely different from the state modern that we have. That much to give you an answer, it is something than what we today know. Very different from what we know today. And how does it look? I mean, then we have to give you a whole range of reading. We will continue to have that discussion. I can't quickly summarize it in five minutes or ten minutes. That's not possible. Regarding translation problem, how do you solve it? Uh, Hersh's thesis, probably you should discuss with him, is that what we recognize as problem of translation is not one problem. It actually consists of at least a dozen problems which are unrelated with each other. If you fix which problem you are confronting, you can solve that. We have ways of getting out and uh, part of those descriptions are available with uh, Harsh's thesis and we are going to add much more and develop. One of the ideas is in three years down the line, we should actually develop a manual. In, uh, in fact, uh, in Gita translation, uh, we have written the transcript fully. We have given alternative translation. We have, we have actually given an alternate translation, which makes more reasonable sense. And how to arrive at that alternate translation and why that is a reasonable translation is also sort of offered an explanation. It's a pretty lengthy paper which runs for about 30-35 paper. It is in review now. I mean, if you want, we will share. You can read that. We can offer better translation. I mean, we can actually make it, we can remove all the problems which have been described here and actually focus on not just meaning, you get the content of it. And how do you get it is something that do the, there is a whole paper that we tried and we would be developing a series of paper in making because simply pointing out there are problems in translation doesn't solve the problem of translator. So we wanted to really help translators in saying look this is how an alternative could be done. So we are also moving towards that we have just taken some steps but this is also a big question for which a quick answer is only. Next, next, next. Next, uh, here. Yes, sir. She stayed in her husband's house. Is she married? Yeah.
you have to make a lot of imagination about the sociology of that period see you don't know when exactly she got married you don't know when she delivered whether she was a child because those days it was normal for 12 13 years children to get married and whether he, you know no but the point is no but but the point is whatever may be the case in order to say this translation is illogical because this is from sanskrita you can read it directly you are saying that you wanted to have see a particular because you are trying to defend another translation because that is what exactly text says i mean me and you have no freedom to talk anything more than what text says because someone composed that text 